As a Buddhist, we know the Buddha's teaching of non-violence right from the childhood, but we are never able to uh, apply it into a governance of a state or a national struggle or socio-economic life of ordinary people. Most of the Buddhist people understood that non-violence means only spiritual practice and it cannot be applicable to a worldly, a worldly life. So therefore, even the Buddhist countries like Tibet never been able to do away with the military force or policing or punishment lot of violence has uh, uh, been taking place, yet they claim they are Buddhist. So, most uh, eye-opener uh, for us is the Gandhi's teaching. No, uh, no violence is not only a spiritual uh, uh, practice, it can be uh, uh, applied, it can be implemented into worldly uh, life, even a national struggle or governance of a state. So that, that, that uh, uh, attracted us very much. And therefore, I, uh, I consider Gandhi as uh, one of the uh, unique teachers uh, who uh, uh, make the Buddhists able to understand how to uh, uh, apply non-violence into um, worldly affairs and the state affairs and the social and um, um, political work. So that that, that is why we um, very much uh, appreciate Gandhi's teaching. The Tibet struggle was not a complete non-violent uh, in the 1950s when China invaded Tibet. A lot of violent resistance was there. Even after 1959, for quite some time, uh, the majority people um, committed no violence, but there there are still uh, violent resistance where continue. It was uh, after 1972 we were able to uh, become complete no violent the entire uh, Tibet movement. And then since then um, uh, we are very happy that uh, uh, this struggle can go. Uh, with uh, non-violent and uh, we apply it inside Tibet and outside Tibet both and it is very uh, effective. In spite of uh, a great uh, propaganda of uh, People's Republic of China and their influence in the world, the Tibet cause never been uh, died in the international scenario and uh, hundreds of thousand people uh, voluntarily uh, come up to support in the cause of Tibet. I think that is uh, only due to uh, we are able to uh, commit ourselves to a uh, non-violent. And uh, China, in spite of their uh, such mighty uh, power, they cannot ignore the voice of Tibet. Uh, that's only because of the uh, non-violent non power. Otherwise, uh, in the name of terrorism or in the name of uh, anything that the Tibet cause uh, could have been uh, brushed away very easily. So uh, it is uh, very um, practi practical and also very uh, effective, uh, even from the viewpoint of uh, politics. So it is uh, no problem for uh, um, applying the Gandhian uh, tradition to the Tibet cause.
particularly I uh, always talk about the Gandhi's writing, the small book uh, Hind Swaraj. We are trying to uh, celebrate the centenary of Hind Swaraj in uh, 2009. It was written in uh, 1909. Gandhi gave a complete picture of uh, Indian situation and that uh, 100% goes with our situation. So I used to say if uh, the word Gandhi used uh, British or British government is substituted by Chinese or Chinese government and wherever he used uh, India or Indians is substituted by Tibetan Tibetans. The entire book is 100% uh, uh, given the situation of uh, Tibet of today. So therefore Gandhian method is uh, uh, very much relevant for us. I think in present global situation, no violence is the only option if the humanity has the desire to uh, survive. And um, let the uh, coming generation to uh, sustain, then there's no uh, any other option than the non-violence. Because the globalization of violence and destruction of uh, um, environment through uh, various kind of structural violence, and also the uh, new um, uh, brand of violence uh, in the form of terrorism, uh, today no one is um, uh, safe nowhere and always uh, people live uh, under threat and danger. So this kind of life cannot be uh, given any solace to uh, any people. So if there is uh, anything to be substituted, because this kind of uh, terror can never be um, encountered by uh, counter-terrorism, there need to be a complete uh, antidote to it, and that is only non-violence. So if people are uh, going to uh, suicidal, then uh, it is okay. Otherwise, uh, if there's little bit of um, will to survive, then non-violence is the only way. It is horrible, and uh, September 11th incident must be condemned, and uh, we should work with a whole heart to prevent such a repetition of this kind of terrorism. Thousands of innocent people have been uh, uh, killed for no cause, and this is uh, uh, completely uh, uh, unacceptable, and we must oppose it by whole force. But at the same time, we should also look the cause of this terrorism. This terrorism can never be put to an end by counter-violence, by counter-force. We have to uh, remove the cause of violence, cause of terrorism. The uh, happenings of 11 September was uh, not without any cause. There was a perpetuated cause in the world which is uh, resulted and expressed in such way. So if we are not um, happy with it, then we must uh, remove the cause. These causes are uh, hatred. And the heat was uh, perpetuated through various uh, social political injustice and uh, inequality among the people, uh, financially, economically, socially, and in very, uh, various things. And also, there have been some kind of uh, indoctrination of hitting uh, with each other. It is a, a, a kind of product of the uh, today's uh, so-called civilization. The ultra-modern or post-modern civilization has uh, uh, escalated this kind of heat with each other. I am a Tibetan Buddhist monk. Uh, we react to the Chinese atrocities. Chinese atrocities are not uh, less than the uh, 11 September uh, incident. We react with a sense of uh, humility and responsibility. We do not uh, blame the entire uh, 
uh, incident to China alone, <coughs> the Tibetan has uh, accumulated a lot of cause for this kind of uh, suffering. So therefore, we do not uh, perpetuate anger and hate towards the Chinese uh, authorities. We try to uh, love them, we try to give them compassion and uh, uh, kindness, and through which we try to reconcile, we try to uh, change their heart. When I uh, take over as uh, Prime Minister of the Tibetan government in exile, I have made it very clear to all of my people that my every action and every decision would be based on three basic principles truth, non-violence, and genuine democratic system. So whatever decision I take, that will be taken through a genuine democratic system based on the truth and non-violence. Anything relates directly or indirectly to violence, I will oppose. Uh, I will not do that. And anything is untruthful, I will not do that. And for that matter, I have to uh, take uh, certain uh, very uh, bold and unpopular decisions, such as uh, privatization of all the government-run uh, business units, uh, which are uh, not very truthful and uh, free from structural violence. So I have closed down everything. And that was quite unpopular. Then. Uh, uh, I have made decision that all the chemical fertilizers which are used in our agriculture settlements and which will be substituted by uh, uh, compost and other things and biochemical uh, uh, um, uh, natural and uh, um, other uh, agriculture system. So these things are temporarily unpopular, but people did not oppose to it. And uh, I think within uh, next four years, I have completed one year, and uh, within next four years, I will be able to uh, uh, completely uh, clean up the uh, administration uh, from any kind of violence and uh, based on uh, truth. So that is, uh, uh, today I think that um, it was not very bad for me to be uh, uh, chosen as a, a Prime Minister, it is of course not uh, uh, consonance to my uh, monkhood and my own nature, but it is a challenge which I have uh, accepted and then uh, I think it is useful as well. The Tibet gets autonomy or not, His Holiness has made a point, the Tibet must be declared as zone of Ahinsa zone of no violence and free from military presence and also free from uh, uh, presence of any kind of destructive weapon. That is our uh, great hope. Uh, the national freedom is uh, secondary, but to make the Tibetan plateau as a zone of uh, non-violent, that is uh, more uh, important for us. So we are trying on that direction. A very different kind of uh, economic system must be built. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama has said several times that a Buddhist middle path economy must be adopted if Tibet gets uh, some kind of genuine autonomy. So for that, uh, I have prepared a blueprint saying that uh, our economy must be non-violent, eco-friendly, self-sufficient, and based on people's genuine need. Our body has a number of basic requirements, which you cannot deny. And to fulfillment of those needs is your basic responsibility, your duty. You have to fulfill those needs. For example, you feel thirst and you must drink water, a clean water. And a clean water is the real need. And today you need some kind of uh, artificial water. 
you are conditioned. That is not the need. It is the greed. You are being fed with sweet water or soap water or um, uh, fruit juice or this and that. Then uh, you are not able to live with uh, clean and genuine good water, which really uh, uh, substance your health and your body. Uh, you need some different kind of drink. So that is greed, that is not need. And a good, well-balanced food is need. And you must prepare such good food, not for taste, but for the health, to sustain the body. Today the food is no connection with your body. It always with your taste. And now it is mostly uh, time and status and um, people uh, think not eating a five-star hotel is uh, some kind of below status and cooking in the home is uh, uh, not very enjoyable and sometimes uh, eating well going in a uh, what you call a fast food and which is very dangerous for health but still you enjoy it so these are not the basic needs these are the uh, greeds and uh, one cloth, two cloth, three cloth is uh, sufficient. One is washing and the other is wearing and the third is saved for some other things. Uh, a three set of cloth is, uh, uh, um, fulfills the um, person's need. But no, you have uh, three, four, five different kind of uh, cloth in uh, 24 hours. For going to office, you need some other, and for playing game, you need some other set of clothes. <laughs> going party, some other set of clothes. To sleep, some other set of clothes. <laughs> All these are the exploitation of the uh, greed. So that has no end. <clears throat> we think we are consuming the uh, consumer goods, but the consumer <clears throat> goods are consuming the person. We are consumed by the uh, uh, consumerism. So we must be, be aware of that. And uh, that means uh, the whole uh, modern concept of development shall have to be discarded. The uh, traditional um, agriculture, traditional nomad, and traditional small scale uh, handicrafts and small scale industry that has to be uh, uh, the basis of uh, whole nation's economy. And the nation's economy must be based on the real need of people, not on the greed of people. The need to be recognized and then we must be satisfied with that. And the greed must be prevented. And then competition must be eliminated, which shall have to be substituted by cooperation. So with this land, then entire the national economy is a uh, can go on those terms, then we will be able to uh, make a non-violent economy. Otherwise, as long as we are in Excel or the Tibetans under the Chinese occupation, we cannot hope for that. In Tibet, there has been um, successively uh, from the 5th Dalai Lama till the 13th Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lamas uh, have ruled the country as the head of state. And all the success with the Dalai Lama, except the seventh, um, uh, the sixth Dalai Lama, from the fifth to thirteenth, all of them were monk. Then, secondly, since fifth Dalai Lama, in Tibet government uh, set up, each office is being headed by two officials. One is a monk official and the other is a lay official. Okay. And uh, that tradition was there. Then it is also some kind of uh, immature democracy. All the lay officials shall have to come from the hereditary noble family. And uh, the monk officials always comes from any work of life, because any can, uh, anybody can become monk, and any monk can become monk official. So at the highest level to the lowest level, everywhere the officials are working, 
jointly among official and the lay official. And this system has been um, uh, remained there for exactly 360 years. This year we are celebrating the, <laughs> yeah, the fifth Dalai Lama's uh, administration is complete 360 uh, years. So for the last 360 years, the monks used to act as ministers. And uh, when we were in Tibet, there used to be uh, five ministers, and out of which four are lay and one is monk. And the monk minister used to be the senior most minister in any way. So that is seems repeated here. Uh, I had the uh, cabinet uh, as a monk and uh, four of my uh, other ministers are lay people. So we uh, do jointly. Now in Tibet there never have been a, a, a female minister. Uh, in the uh, government officials there are no female um, government officials till 1959. Uh -huh. And after coming to SL, there have been many uh, lady ministers, but not yet a non-minister. We have non-officials, but we don't, uh, we don't have uh, until now um, non-minister. But in India, during last about 20 years, the population of nuns is uh, very much increased and uh, the educational standard, education standard of nuns are also very much upgraded. So now the population of monk and nuns are almost uh, equal. And uh, we didn't have any uh, bhikkhuni in Tibet for a long time. And uh, now they have restored the bhikkhuni tradition uh, from Singapore uh, several years back. And now we have uh, not very big but um, small number of uh, bhikkhunis and uh, which has been now gradually accepted by the uh, society. So it is, uh, mm, for them it is a good, a, a good change. Mm -hmm. The concept of democracy um, which prevailed in the most of countries today is uh, of a Western style of democracy. And the Western style of democracy is, an, in my opinion, not a genuine democracy. And as a Buddhist, we try to have a genuine democracy. That genuine democracy means uh, at the highest level, you have to uh, remove, uh, as an ultimate goal, you have to remove the uh, duality between ruled and the ruler. This uh, duality is uh, uh, eliminated, then there will be genuine people's rule, then that will be genuine democracy. I think that is the Buddhist concept of equality on the basis of potential. So that is uh, very difficult to achieve. Until that, a democracy in which the people's conscience is not um, overruled by the majority or by by anything else. Each people must have his or her own freedom of thinking and the freedom of expression. Uh, that is absolutely necessary. <clears throat> Today the multi-party system, uh, there is very difficult to have a real public opinion because the people has not given the freedom to think for themselves. Uh, the uh, opinion is uh, formulated by the parties and then they indoctrinate you <laughs> through various uh, uh, media and advertisement. So today people doesn't have uh, uh, to understand what is your need. Uh, you have to uh, decide your needs according to the uh, <coughs> Producers, uh, the the people product uh, consumers to good, and then uh, they indoctrinate you. You must have it, without which you cannot uh, survive. That kind of psychology has been created, brainwashed. Mm -hmm. So that brainwashing is one of the uh, most uh, uh, dangerous um, domination 
open the uh, free mind. So democracy needs to uh, restore or protect that freedom of thought and the freedom of expression, not in the modern uh, concept, but in the reality. So that is the Buddhist uh, uh, outlook of our democracy. Freedom, equality, justice, and uh, fraternity. This four is the uh, very important concept of our democracy. But the um, concept of uh, all these three pillars are entirely different from the Buddhist viewpoint. We talk about justice. The uh, highest justice is justice according to natural law, not man-made law. Man-made law can never give you uh, the real justice. And man-made law is uh, mostly depend on the concept of revenge. And the concept of revenge is not a justice. So we have to uh, think about the justice on the basis of natural law. Natural law means law of karma and law of nature. So this is a big subject. We can dwell upon it what the concept of justice according to Buddhism. Okay, okay. Then freedom, uh, freedom, the, what the Buddha talk about freedom is freedom from the bondage of negative emotions, the, uh, the uh, defilement of mind. As long as the defilement of mind is there, you cannot be free. In a society, we cannot eliminate uh, the uh, uh, default of mind, but we can reduce it. Today, the negative emotions have been promoted. intentionally promoted, promoted for uh, business purposes. Our greed is very much promoted by outside influence. And then ultimately, through um, practice of dharma, you can eliminate also. That is the freedom. Freedom from one's own negative emotions. Equality on the basis of uh, potential of development. Each sentient being is uh, having the potential to become a Buddha. That has to be recognized. Then only that basis you can be equal. Otherwise, the uh, today's Western concept of equality is equality among equals. Can never be unequals, can be equal. Uh, that has to be discussed and then uh, we shall have to develop what is equality means. And the fraternity on the basis of uh, compassion, selfless compassion, Fraternity not on the basis of uh, uh, power politics, not on the basis of selfish ends. That is not the real fraternity. So from the Buddhist viewpoint, the basic concept of the democracy will be entirely different from that of today's Western uh, uh, political science, what this is. Then there are certain things are good, the separation of power and division of power. This we can adopt. It is a, a good method, not good philosophy. They are not philosophy. These are institutionalization and methods that we can take. Whatever is possible, we can take from them. Now, we recommend a party-less democracy. Uh, Multi-party as a, a necessary uh, condition for a genuine democracy is uh, not acceptable. I don't oppose if there is a multi-party, but multi-party always goes in competition. And uh, anything goes in competition, that is violence, uh, ultimately. Uh, competition means one shall have to wait, uh, win and the other shall have to lose and uh, uh, winner
creates the uh, arrogance and the loser suffers uh, from the hatred and then ultimately it goes into um, uh, into um, violence so a genuine democracy <coughs> there must be uh, there must not be any uh, competition only cooperation and consensus shall have to be uh, uh, evolved election be like uh, choosing the individuals we are doing at this moment uh, the tibet parliament members have been choose two tier system of election the first election is a uh, nominate the candidates by the people uh, each people has a uh, right to nominate certain number of people as a candidate each individual each individual for example we have 10 uh, regional representatives so each voter can nominate 10 people's name as a, a candidate and according to the, those world pooled the highest uh, number of votes are pooled they are put as a candidate then uh, 20 25 23 candidates have been listed and then you have to choose out of them the, at the second election so therefore no one comes uh, voluntarily i will be the representative there's no campaign no campaign no campaign campaign is uh, not allowed and only the uh, by data of uh, the candidates are being called from the individuals and their supporters and uh, then that is uh, scrutinized by the election commission and then election commission uh, give it to all the voters this candidate has this much experience and he have done this and this and so individual candidates do not uh, campaign do not make a campaign from the buddhist view point we have the three shiksha that means three fold education that is the buddhist uh, fundamental buddhist uh, rule of education shila to discipline your physical and vocal samadhi to discipline your mind and then pragya the awakening of your wisdom inner intelligence that is the education not accumulation of uh, uh, information that's not education it is only a uh, uh, that kind of education you can give to a computer you put every information in and it will get back uh, so that awakening of mind is the uh, basic uh, objective of education so therefore i very much like the um, krishna murti's uh, statement he always says um, flowering in goodness awakening of human intelligence is the objective of the education so education must able to uh, flower your good nature and do away your evil nature and to open up the in, your wisdom intelligence and then uh, even you don't have uh, much information you will able to uh, discriminate what is right what is wrong what is good what is bad so this is the so this kind of education is almost disappear today uh, you have to um, memorize many things and then uh, you have to repeat it when examination conducts and uh, most of these informations are irrelevant to our uh, life uh, all of these informations are uh, perpetuating or uh, exploiting your negative emotions